My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other people want to make friends. I just am trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain, but to educate. Put everything in context. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me, Jim Kramer. Wall Street can factor in pretty much everything instantly. But today you can see how hard it was to calculate the impact of countless unarmed Israeli citizens being massacred. I mean, how the heck could we rally with the Dow gaining 197 points, S&P climbing 0.63%, and the Nasdaq advancing 0.39%? Maybe it's because there seemed to be no direct economic consequence for the United States. Maybe it's because the markets have become desensitized to war after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But if you look at the timeline of today's trading, we started off the red. We traded lower all morning. And then in early afternoon, we started rallying. Why? Because Fed Board of Governors Vice Chair Philip Jefferson made dovish comments that immediately pushed stocks higher. He told us that the Fed is, quote, in a position to proceed carefully in assessing the extent of any additional firming that may be necessary, end quote. Jefferson then continued, quote, we are in a sensitive period of risk management where we have to balance the risk of not tightening enough against the risk of being too restrictive, end quote. Hey, previously, the Fed was much more worried about the risk from tightening too little. So that statement was all it took for people to grasp that the rate hikes might be on hold for the moment. It was that statement, not the horrific slaughter in Israel that controlled today's action. Now, it's not like nothing happened. These war crimes by Hamas are unprecedented in their scale, and we're now looking at an open war situation between Israel and the Gaza, Gaza Strip. But Wall Street's accustomed to dealing with a lack of peace in the Middle East, isn't it? Twenty-odd years ago, it seemed like there was a new suicide bombing every week, yet our stock market still did fine. Sure, defense stocks went higher in recognition of what's going on. Unlike the tug of war over Ukrainian aid going on right now in the capital, I'm sure that our government will do what's necessary to protect its friends from its enemies. The U.S. mobilized the full-scale resupply of the Israelis in the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago, something that saved them from being overrun by all sides. I'm confident that we'll do so again if necessary, hence the run defense stocks throughout the day. I doubt it'll come to that, though. The reaction in some moments seemed downright counterintuitive, with the oils and defense stocks soaring, cybersecurity stocks faring well, too, while the rest of the market initially got pummeled. Then, with Vice Chair Jefferson's comments, the buyers shrugged off the Hamas invasion and returned to the same opportunity they saw on Friday. So we caught a rally centered on the day's biggest winners. I think some of the confusion came down to the fact that there was no bond trading today, thanks to Columbus Day. Uh, everybody's taking their cue from bonds, but uh, they were totally lost today. They didn't know what to do. If the bond market were open today and interest rates had gone higher, thanks to the rallies in oil and natural gas, then I think the stock market would absolutely not have had this rally. But the presumption was rates would have gone lower, hence the rally, because of the statements from the Fed. Now, we'll know more tomorrow when the bond market reopens. But yes, the algorithms that drive the linkage could extend today's gains. I understand some of the market's confusion about the war in the Middle East. The invasion's closest analog, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, caused oil to spike as OPEC decided to boycott any country that helped Israel, including the United States. In response, oil went up 300% to $12 a barrel in a short period of time. But that was a Saudi-led boycott, and these days Saudi Arabia has a much better relationship with Israel. Same goes for the other oil-rich gold monarchies. Both oil and defense went up indiscriminately, uh, most likely because of the moronic ETF-ization of the market. I mean, that's what enables Huntington Ingalls, a Navy shipbuilder, to go up as much as General Dynamics, which I have no doubt will be called upon to provide more tanks if Israel finds itself shorthanded. Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman have enough needle-moving electronics, but I doubt Lockheed's joint strike fighter will be called into action given the fact that Hamas doesn't have an air force. In the end, this is not 1973, where Israel is up against conventional armies from Egypt and Syria. This time, they're putting down an insurgency, which requires different hardware. Now, should oil have rallied even more than what we saw today? Now, that's a legitimate and big question. The Permian Basin in Canada can equal the current demand for our country. The producers in the Permian are basically free riding on OPEC Plus and Russia's production cuts. Uh, they seem determined not to overproduce, thereby destroying these higher prices. So it seems reasonable to believe that oil should go higher. But to me, it's surprising that oil isn't up more given its recent retreat. That, that smacks more of the concern I had last week when I said that a huge part of the earlier oil rally was simply short covering. 
It's natural gas propelled by the catch-up trade because there's no cold weather to speak of. That had an especially good day. Given that there are so few pure natural gas plays, let me point out again that the winner is Coterra, where CEO Tom Jordan told us on Mad Money that he's got plenty of oil and plenty of gas. But he was pivoting to natural gas because of his dollar cost. Since then, the gain in natural gas is about 27 percent less than two months. It exceeds the gain in oil. Such a good call. What about the rest of the market? I found Jefferson's comments surprising because I was thinking that there'll be no cessation in the Fed's fight against inflation. Jefferson's comments gave a green light to all sorts of buying of tech, much again led by the Magnificent Seven. It is worth asking whether the extended rally in Apple may be signals that the iPhone 15 is doing much better than expected or certainly much better than the bears keep talking about. It is worth pondering whether Israel is just a distraction. I hate to say it like that, but at least from an investing perspective, it's not like Ukraine, which is a major source of food and caused sanctions against Russia, an important source of oil and gas. Ukraine represents 13% of the world's calories. Both oil and food, along with housing costs, represent the remaining holdouts in the Fed's battle against inflation. We often forget how much our inflation problem was caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. By contrast, Israel is one of our most important allies, but it's a very small country, so the financial impact is not that large, even as the symbolic impact is enormous. Now, I lamented the lack of bull marks last week versus, say, just a few months ago, before we realized that inflation was a lot more persistent than we thought and rates were much lower. The strength in the market overall remains in the companies with the best balance sheets, including the Magnificent Seven. Now, I'll give you more of the other winners from higher interest rates later in the show. It's a really good list. So is the market heartlessly indifferent to the pictures, the cries, the shooting of innocence at a concert that triggered massive retaliation? Let me put it this way. The market is about stocks. Stocks are about companies. Companies are about prospects. And there's nothing here that impacts those prospects save the possibility of this expanding into a war between Israel and Iran. The bottom line, this is a situation where sadness begets more sadness, but no selling on its own, because Wall Street's much more interested in what we heard from the vice chair of the Fed on the eve of earnings season, and it cares more about corporate profits. Bob in Texas, Bob. Yeah, Jim. Uh, yes. I've been, can you hear me? You sound great, Bob. Okay, uh, I've been uh, purchasing club stock Nvidia for the last few years, Excellent. and uh, it, the last purchase I made was at 439. Okay, and uh, I know that uh, years ago Apple split at 350, and I don't know what considerations are made, but do you think there's a possibility? Uh, I know one thing is it, it's it's so that there it makes it more affordable to people to buy when they split. Uh, do you think there's any possibility that NVIDIA might split? Well, it's a great question, Bob, because you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been pro-split. A lot of the professionals just say, Jim, come on, you have one pencil, you're breaking two, do you have two pencils, you have a half pencil, half pencil. Here's the way I look at it, exactly the way Bob does. And I wish NVIDIA would split, but that's up to Jensen Wong and his team. And they play it very close to the vets and have given me no insight on what they might do. Can we go to Callaway in Tennessee? Callaway. Hey, Jim, how are you? I am good, Callaway. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for taking my question. Of course. Um, I was I was curious. Uh, since its IPO, Arm has stayed above its initial trading price of 51 and is now at a P.E. ratio of 106 almost. And it's only slightly lower than NVIDIA's P.E. of 110. My question is, do we see this P.E. come down after the lockout period maybe? And what is the fair value for the stock in your uh, opinion? Or great should, question. should it actually yeah. have? Yeah. Now, here's what happened today. All the, you know, the vast majority of analysts recommended the stock. I think the stock is, uh, can, can trade higher. Maybe it can trade up to 60, but uh, the lockup was certainly going to release a lot of stock. But uh, that's not what I'm concerned about. I like what you just said, which is it trades at a higher price range multiple than NVIDIA, and that is wrong. It's a trade at a lower multiple than NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a faster, better rower. Max in Florida. Max. Hey, Jim. Thanks for taking my call. Of course, Max. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me. I'm Thank calling you. today about Academy Sports, ticker ASO. While the retail sector has sold off due to inventory shrinkage, ASO has seemed to avoid this issue. They're in the process of expanding from 270 to 400 stores in the next four years. Given that all their stores are profitable within 12 months and with their current year earnings near $8 a share, should I expect future earnings near $12 a share? <laughs> and if so, would that make this stock cheap due to their debt to equity being about 0.33? It is incredibly cheap right now, but I could have said that since uh, the spring. And all the stock has really done is go down. I think this is a level where I would start buying, but not aggressively because this thing is getting clubbed. All right. 
Wall Street can usually calculate things pretty instantly and immediately. But today we start to see that stocks are much less impacted by international conflict, no matter how horrendous, and much more swayed by the words from a, a Fed chieftain. On Man Money tonight, with the Fed signaling a higher for longer strategy when it comes to rates, we need to adjust our strategy. So tonight I'm focusing on companies with strong financial positions that I think could do well in this market. And over today, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson published a bearish note, what else is new, that this market could get uglier. So I called up one of our favorite technicians, Larry Williams, to get his take on the matter. And you do not want to miss that big call. And Birkenstock is ready to walk into the New York Stock Exchange this week when it IPOs. So should you try this one on for size, or could it be a poor fit for your portfolio? I'm sharing where I come down. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.